Welcome back, everyone. We have in plant taxonomy been talking about angiosperm plant families for the last two or three weeks, and we will continue that today, continuing our tour specifically of the rosid groups. And in this lecture, we will talk about five new families. They are the Sapindaceae, Brassicaceae, Malvaceae, Anagraceae, and Geraniaceae. And let's just again orient to where these groups are in an angiosperm phylogeny. So we've talked about this a couple of times. Down here we have those basal angiosperms that diverged before the split between monocots and dicots. Then we get that monocot-dicot split here, and we've come up, we've talked about some basal eudicots those early diverging eudicot lineages. And then we jumped off into this group right here, this big group of rosids. And you can see that labeled here. And some of the groups we've already talked about are boxed. We've also talked about, I think now, a few that aren't boxed, like the Oxalidaceae and Malpigiales um, in our last lecture. However, we haven't yet come down this branch. And this branch goes to the rosids too. And so these are the groups of uh, plant orders and families that we will be talking about today. You can see that when we complete this, that will complete our tour of the rosids. And our next stop will be coming out here towards this major group, the asterids. So the Eurosids too, that unexplored group that I just pointed out, um, they're also called the Malvidae, but I'm going to tell you, you do not need to memorize this because they're not really distinguished, distinguished by any obvious phenotypic traits. Instead, we know that this group exists largely based on molecular evidence. There's also a suggestion in your textbook that we still need to do some work understanding relationships within the rosids generally. So some of this information could change down the road. I will remind you of some general characteristics of the rosids. They tend to have unfused perianth parts. We've talked about this before. It's not always true and we'll see exceptions. And they tend to have more stamen than they do calyx parts or corolla parts. So in other words, more stamen than petals and more stamen than sepals. So let's start our tour of five families. Our first family here is the Sapindaceae, or the soapberry family. And this is a family that is largely tropical or temperate. And we are going to focus on temperate um, members of the family that occur here in the Carolinas. Basically, if we were to talk about the entire soapberry family, we would see that it's really hard with the characteristics we're focusing on to describe this group. We would end up saying it was variable for almost every characteristic. So instead of doing that, what we're going to do is focus on two subfamilies and talk about their characteristics. And if you see a specimen that meets either of these subfamilies, then of course it must belong to the larger family, the Sapindaceae. So the two subfamilies that we will be focusing on are the Hippocastanoideae and the Aceroideae, um, as your textbook defines them. It's slightly different depending on the source. And we will take those up, I think, in that order. So we've said that we are going to talk about two subfamilies within the Sapindaceae, and those were the Hippocastanoideae and the Aceroideae. So this slide shows you just basic summary information about these two groups with Hippocastanoideae on the left and Aceroideae on the right. The Hippocastanoideae include buckeyes and horse chestnuts. And you can see what a leaf of these groups look like. It is palmately compound. 
if you are keying out a member of this subfamily, then in your key, which is Radford, Ollies, and Bell, or Rab, these authors consider the subfamily to actually be a family unto itself. So if you're to look up a plant like this in Rab, you would look it up under the family name Hippocastanaceae. However, if I ask you what the family is on the lab exam, you would still tell me that it's Sapindaceae because our more contemporary understanding is that this is now just a subfamily within the Sapindaceae. Similarly, if you were to look up a tree on this side from the Aceroidea or the maples, if you were to look this up in Radford, Ollies, and Bell, you would look it up under the family name Aceraceae because when that book was written, this was considered to be a separate family. Again, on an exam, you would tell me the family for this is Sapindaceae, but then when you king it out, you'd have to start here in your book. And this is a maple leaf from uh, the childhood home where I grew up. So let's move on and talk about vegetative traits. You got a sort of a sense of this on the previous slide. Um, first, for the plants that we will consider, these are going to be trees or shrubs. There are lianas or woody vines elsewhere in the world, but for our part of the country, this is what we have. And elsewhere in the world, this is not true, but for us, Sapindaceae will have opposite leaves. The shape of those leaves will differ between the groups. So for maples in the Aceroidea, the leaves are going to usually be simple, like this leaf on the left. This is um, a red maple. However, there is one species of maple that we have in the southeastern United States that actually has compound leaves. And those leaves are sometimes trifoliate, like the one shown here. So you can see three leaflets, one, two, three. Sometimes they are actually five leaflets. I'll draw in the other two. And so then this would be pinnately compound rather than uh, trifoliate. So those are your options for the Aceroidae side of the family. On the Hippocastanoidea side of the family, we will always have palmately compound leaves, like this leaf pictured on the right. You can see five leaflets, and they are diverging like fingers from a hand. Let's move on to Sapindaceae reproductive traits. The flowers are in clusters. However, unlike some of the trees we've talked about already, um, let's say Betulaceae and Phagaceae, the flowers are not in catkins. So that's a small distinguishing characteristic. And again, there's two possibilities depending on which subfamily. For the maples or the Aceroidea, the flowers are going to be reduced and sometimes perfect, sometimes imperfect. They're going to have some characteristics that will make them easy to recognize. For flowers in the Hippocastanoidea part of the family, the buckeyes, the flowers are going to be very different. They will be showy, they will sometimes be perfect, and um, they'll be easy to recognize because um, they are so showy. Let's spend some time now just looking at the Aceroidae or the maples. And so here's a picture of the leaves that we talked about. You can see really clearly a pinnately compound example, a trifoliate example, and then up here on the right, the most common form that you will see. So most maple leaves look like some variant of this with a palmately compound simple blade. Flowers on the maples or Aceroidea are usually imperfect and they can come 
in staminate or pistillate forms. So at the top here, you can see a staminate flower, and we won't worry too much about the traits here. The more easily recognized flower is the pistillate flower, which you can see down below. And what you can see, even at this early stage of development, is that there are clearly two wings forming. And I'll just draw that over here. We have the perianth like so, coming up in the middle. We have a forked stigma, which tells you that the pistil is formed from two carpels because there are two parts. And then you can see there are these wing-like forms on either side. And these are going to develop into wings on the fruit when this gets bigger. And so here's an example of what this ovary is going to develop into, or what the, the carpal will develop into. You can see the large wing right here on one side, and then there's a division and we have another wing on the other side. And so, at least for females, this is the really easy way to distinguish this part of the Sapindaceae, the subfamily. Let's move on now and focus more on the buckeyes. So for vegetative traits, we've already said this, but just to remind you, we have palmately compound leaves, seen right here, and these are always going to be shrubs or trees. They're typically large shrubs for us that are sort of on the verge of tree size. And let's think a little bit or consider a little bit how we have buckeyes in popular culture. So one way is um, Ohio State, not my favorite uh, school or team because I did my PhD at Michigan. But nonetheless, I will give them some credit for having a name based on a plant and for having um, the picture of the leaf be the symbol on their helmets. And so you can see this is a palmately compound buckeye leaf that is adorning um, the football helmet. Let's look now at the flowers of buckeye. I said earlier that these were showy, and you can see that here. Some notable traits of buckeye flowers, um, they are showy, they are zygomorphic or bilaterally symmetrical. We can have either staminate or perfect flowers. They have four petals, and four is not a number that we've seen very much although we will see it in a couple of the other groups we talk about today. And so you can see that here we've got one, two, three, and four petals. So that is at least relatively unusual. There's a superior ovary, but we've seen that a lot. The ovary is composed of three carpels. That was different than in the Aceraceae or Aceroideae part of the family where we saw that it was clearly composed of two carpels. The fruit on the buckeye side is a capsule, but the capsule has a leathery pericarp. So the outer portion of the fruit here, you can see it's kind of spiky. Over here, it is smooth, but it has a very leathery feel to it. You can see there's multiple seeds inside, um, at least in this instance. The seeds can appear nut-like, as shown here. This is from the buckeye tree, and they especially look like a nut when there's only one seed per fruit. However, what we're looking at here is not a fruit. The part I'm circling is the seed itself. Um, incidentally, um, buckeyes are poisonous, but there is a chocolate confection made out of chocolate and peanut butter on the inside, also called a buckeye, and this is definitely not poisonous. In fact, I highly recommend. So to summarize this confusing family, Sapindaceae 
includes maples and buckeyes. They are trees or shrubs for us. They have opposite leaves for both of these two groups. And so that's really a unifying feature for our purposes. And it's maybe the first, or at least one of the first op opposite families that we've seen so far. Actually, I can think of one more opposite family and hopefully you can remember what that is. The mating system is variable. The flowers are either actinomorphic, um, as in the staminate maples, or they are psychomorphic and they can be showy for the buckeyes. Sepals are variable. Um, on the maple side, we're not going to worry so much about it. But on the buckeye side, there's four and they're showy. The number of stamen is not going to be super helpful for us. So we'll move on to the gynoecium. Remember, we had those two fused carpels for the maple and three fused carpels for the buckeyes. In both cases, these were superior. The fruit on the maple side is a samara because it has wings, but it's a schizocarp because those two sides break apart into individual structures. So you've seen this before. You've seen these fruits hanging on maple trees and try to draw this accurately. Something like this. And when these become mature, it splits right here and this side disperses and that side disperses separately. On the Buckeye side, we saw instead that leathery capsule with a seed that looks like a nut. We will move on to the next family. This one is a super important family. It is Brassicaceae, also known as Cruciferae. And this is one of those unusual families that has two names. These are both formally accepted names. This is the more modern of the two names, Brassicaceae. But Cruciferae is considered a conserved name. because it was deemed so important of a name and it was so well established when we developed modern naming systems that we decided we should keep it. All modern family names end with AC and all modern family names are named after some plant within the family. So in this case, Brassica is the genus. Conserved names did not necessarily follow those rules you do need to know both of these two names. This is a very diverse group in Radford, Ollie's and Bell. It's about 30 pages, which is larger than any family we've talked about so far with, I think, two exceptions. Um, I think probably the roses and the bean and pea family, the Fabaceae, are larger than this. For our purposes, these are typically herbaceous. The leaves are lobed or divided. We'll see what that looks like. And this is an important trait. The inflorescence is a raceme. And we learned about racemes earlier in the semester. Remember, it looks like a spike, except the flowers have pedials, which you can see here. Let's look at Brassicaceae or Cruciferae flowers. The flowers are distinctive and I think easily recognized. They have four petals and those four petals form a cross-like shape. So the cross shape is most easily seen here. This is an arugula flower and they are at right angles like so. And so because they form a cross-like shape, that is where the word Cruciferi comes from. Crucifer, like crucifix, referring to obviously the cross. The anthers in Brassicaceae are, there are six of them, but they are in a distinctive arrangement. So you can see there are two lower anthers and there are four upper anthers. And to the best of my knowledge, this is always the pattern. So two unusual traits, the four petals 
and now 2 plus 4 for the anther arrangement. If we continue on um, into the middle of the flower, we're going to get to the gynoecium. And the gynoecium is comprised of two carpels. They are syncarpus forming one pistil. And at maturity, they are going to develop into a solique. We've talked about soliques when we talked about fruit types. And we said that a solique is a fruit that is dry, it is dehiscent, and at maturity, both sides open, and there is a membrane that divides the two halves. You can see that membrane right here in the right-hand photograph. It's called a septum, um, just like the divider between your nostrils is called a septum, but I won't hold you responsible for this name. So fruits are so weak. Let's go over key features of Brassicaceae one more time. First, make sure you know both of the names. We said it's herbaceous, alternate leaved, simple, the leaves are lobed or divided. The flowers are perfect, so both um, stamen and, uh, and the pistil. The raceme is a key trait. The four sepals, incidentally, they are deciduous, so don't be surprised if you see flowers without them. And the four petals in the shape of a cross, that is a key trait. The four plus two, androecium, is a key trait. And the gynoecium of two carpels with a fruit of a solique is another key trait. Lots of distinctive features for this family. Let's talk about some uses of Brassicaceae. It's the mustard family, so it won't surprise you that it gives us some edible species like mustards. In fact, most of the Brassicaceae are edible. And it gives us some important food plants like Brassica oleracea. This single species which was, I think, domesticated um, around the Mediterranean shores in Europe, has been uh, domesticated into several different vegetables. This includes broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, kale, Brussels sprouts, and kohlrabi. Kohlrabi is the least familiar, but it looks sort of like a, kind of like a turnip, um, and it sometimes has the name broccoli root. So each one of these vegetables is really just a way of cultivating Brassica oleracea into some different plant organ. For example, broccoli is really emphasizing the flowers. Each of those little green nodes at the end of a broccoli stem is going to develop into a separate flower. Cauliflower takes that backwards one step and it emphasizes development of the inflorescence without the inflorescence tissue yet having reached the stage of making flowers. Cabbage is leaves and the leaves are still wrapped tightly around the apex of the stem. Kale has um, domestic, been domesticated for leaves as well, but now we have an elongate stem. Brussels sprouts are axillary buds and kohlrabi is the stem So I just pulled up a picture of kohlrabi for those who aren't familiar with it. And this is what it looks like. It's a stem, but the stem is now selected to be wide. And so it forms this spherical shape that looks kind of like um, a root vegetable, even though it's technically part of the stem. There are a bunch of other edible members of the genus Brassica. Pardon me for that. These include turnips, of course, mustard greens, radish, arugula, which is sometimes called rocket, oil seed rape, which is the seed that gives us canola oil, and horseradish, which is especially pungent and gives us the uh, um, what we would use to spice soy sauce if we were eating sushi. 
And so here's a picture of what an actual horseradish root would look like. My understanding is we can't grow this in South Carolina because it needs to have a cold period that is colder than what our winters will give us. So if you did want to grow this, you would have to dig it up and put it in the fridge over the winter. We have some uses for brassicaceae besides food. Um, we have some garden flowers that are cultivated to be showy. Things like dame's rocket is an example. We also use brassicaceae extensively in scientific research. This is sort of the of the um, plant world. Um, it gives us specifically Arabidopsis thaliana, which is the most common uh, model system for working on plant genetics. Let's move on and talk about our next family. This is Malvaceae or the mallows. And let me just get my pen. So this family includes trees, shrubs, lianas, and herbs. So the diverse habit. A important feature is it has mucilage canals. So there's a mucus that is released if the tissue is cut. And we'll talk about that when we talk about okra. And another trait that's not always present, but it's often there and it's really distinctive, is an epicalyx. So epi means on the outside, and you know the calyx is the sepals. So the epicalyx is this extra layer of sepals outside of the normal sepals. And you can see them here. It's sort of hard to tell on this one what is calyx and what's epicalyx. But you can see there's two green layers. Over here on this right-hand picture, it's even more clear. We have further towards the petals, you can see there are five sepals. And then more basal to those is this extra whorl of sepal-like um, material that is termed the epicalyx. I guess we call those bracts. The inside of the flower is also very distinctive. There are five sepals. We talked about the epicalyx and there are five petals. So the number five is pretty common in the rosids and this is just one more example. But the distinctive feature is that in many cases, not all, but I'd say the majority with which I'm familiar, the stamen form a tube around the style and there are many anthers that then split off from that tube up near the apex, just below the stigmas. So here you can see five bulbous stigmas. Incidentally, that's going to tell you that the pistil is comprised of five carpels. And you can see the many anthers that are um, dispersing their pollen up at the top of this anther tube. So we've only seen this trait, um, a tube of stigmas in a couple of cases. We saw it in Faboidae, um, one of the subgroups of the beans. And then we saw something kind of similar in violet where we had five anthers that were forming, um, that were coming together to form a tube-like structure around the style. Here, they're really much more united than in violet, where they're just sort of flapped together. Here, this tissue is all attached. Malvasi then is very easy to recognize. It also has several important uses. So of probably the most economic value is cotton. And you can see a cotton flower has those characteristics. You can see these anthers forming a tube and then, or the stamen forming a tube with the anthers coming off individually in the middle of this cotton flower. And here's the fruit of a cotton where obviously we get fibers for making fabric. There are several other uses for Malvasi. This includes okra and the flower of okra is pictured here on the left. It's again, very showy. And you can see this tube of yellow anthers. Malvasi gives us chocolate. 
And so here is a chocolate fruit. And I believe that we actually use the seeds of the chocolate to make um, our edible food. And in parts of Asia, durian fruit is very popular. It is um, sort of legendary how smelly this fruit is. It's kind of like some of the smelliest European cheeses and people tend to love it or hate it. And I'm told that there are restaurants in parts of Asia where, or hotels where they have signs that say no durian, because if someone eats a durian fruit, it will stink up other people's rooms in the hotel. To summarize the Malvaceae or Mallow family, we said variable forms, alternate leaves, which is the norm, the mating system is variable, the flower symmetry was actinomorphic. Important traits are that epicalyx, we have the five plus five for the actual sepals and the petals, andurisium, many stamen forming a tube, that is super helpful, the gynoecium superior, and it's five carpels. Fruit is variable. And since, before we move on, since it's the mallow family, I should mention that the mucilage in the mallow plant is what was historically used to make marshmallow snacks, which we now just make from sugar and call marshmallow instead. So we are more than halfway done. We have, I think, two more families to cover the next of which is the Anagrasi, or evening primrose family. This is another distinctive family that I think you will learn to recognize fairly easily. Um, it's not the most important economically, but it does give us a bunch of very attractive garden flowers, and so you may know it for that reason. It's got several key features that make it easy to recognize. One is that it has perianth in fours, so four sepals and four petals. We've seen the four petals now a couple of times. We saw it in Brassicaceae. We also saw it in um, Hippocastanaceae hip or Hippocastanoideae, as we call it now, within the Sapindaceae family. Anagrasi has a very inferior ovary. And so I'll show you that in a couple of photographs. Um, if you can find the ovary, then you will almost immediately know it's Anagrasi. The problem is the ovary is so far down that sometimes students don't even notice it because they think it's part of the pedial, not the ovary. Let's take a look at what that looks like. Here is a flower. This is Anothera speciosa, which you can find in South Carolina. And you can see there is a hypanthium of sorts right here. And then way down below it, here where it gets a little bit, um, where it bulges again, this is the ovary. And the flower, um, the photograph is cut off, but this ovary would probably continue down as far as I've drawn it here. So that's pretty noticeable. Another trait that's pretty easily noticed is that there's a four-parted stigma. This is an indicator that the pistil is comprised of four carpels. And you can see this is a feature that kind of jumps out at you because the stigma lobes are really quite large. And so you can see me outlining this in the upper left photograph but you can even see parts of this in the upper right photograph, like so. And incidentally, you're not responsible for memorizing this, but the pollen in this group is extremely large and has unusual shapes, like shown in this bottom left photograph. These pollen grains are so large that you can reasonably easily see them with the naked eye. I'm going to show you several examples to give you a sense of diversity within this family. So the first one here is Enchanter's Nightshade, or Circeae. And you can see 
the, the stigma lobes, I guess, are less obvious or not apparent on this species. But you can see the four um, petals and back here behind the petals, you can see that inferior ovary. Here's another example. This is Guara. And here you can see really easily the four-parted ovary. One, two, three, four. You can also see way back here on the flower that very inferior ovary. And epilobium, or fireweed, has these traits too. This looks like pedial, or uh, I keep saying pedial, I, I'm sorry for that. This is the pedicel, of course. And the pedicel has a highly inferior ovary. You would find, if you were to dissect this, a whole line of very tiny seeds You'd find four lines going down all the way to the base of the pedicel, or I should say to the base of this structure that appears like a pedicel. And another example, this is Ludwigia, and this is a plant that grows in uh, wet areas. Again, you can see the four um, petals really clearly. In these photos, it's harder to see that inferior ovary. And one last example, the Ludwigia doesn't have a really obvious four-parted stigma, but Anothera, evening primrose, does. You can see that in the bottom left photograph. And in the bottom right photograph, you can see the, <clears throat> the area where that long inferior ovary would occur. So some general traits for this family. For our purposes, this is going to be herbaceous, even though it's woody elsewhere in the world. The leaves, variable, alternate, or opposite, so that's not helpful. Flowers are typically perfect. The flowers we've seen are actinomorphic. There's a hypanthium, and I just pointed out in one photograph but it's often elongated into a tube and the ovary is at the very base of that tube. There are four distinct sepals, four distinct petals, and so we've already said the number four is unusual. The androecium is composed of two whorls of stamen that have four anthers each, and that's hard to see in photographs. Um, you can see four of those stamen in this upper right photograph here. Um, the other four um, are, I think, alternate to them, but further in and harder to see. I'm not sure why we can't see those here. The gynoecium, I've said this enough, inferior and made out of four carpels, which gives those four lobes on at least uh, several of the flowers. And the fruit, um, we won't worry about. We won't need it to identify these. Our next plant family is the Geraniaceae, and I think this is the last one in this lecture. So Geraniaceae are herbaceous plants, and they tend to have showy flowers, um, the color range that we see is from the oranges through the reds and then pinks and purples. So here are some examples of uh, those flower colors. The leaves are typically alternate, but they can be opposite if they are on a flowering stem beneath their subtending and inflorescence. And so you can see some opposite leaves in this upper photograph. The leaves are highly lobed, like this geranium right here in the bottom right, or they can be even dissected, as you can see in a couple of these other species shown here. There are two whorls of stamen, but one whorl does not necessarily develop, so it may be staminodal. So what staminodal means is, 
Let me see if I can write. Undeveloped. Nope, not very clearly. Stamen. You can clearly recognize them, but they won't form functioning anthers with fertile pollen. There's nectaries alternate to the petals, but I'm going to put that in parentheses because you will not need to know that trait to identify this family. The flowers, this is another one of our five families where everything is a multiple of five. So the flowers typically have five carpels. The style has five lobes on the stigma, or five stigma lobes rather, which is the easiest way to know that there are five carpels. And a new feature that we have not seen before is that the style is going to mature into a beak. And so you can see that on this really obvious example, and it's not usually this obvious. This is sort of the crazy extreme of this trait. But this is the style here that has formed um, this long conical structure. And the beak, as this is called, is going to help the seeds disperse. And I'll show you a photograph of that momentarily. Some uh, species within this group are called crane's bills. And they're called that obviously because this beak looks like the beak of a crane. So here's how that uh, beak functions. The flower at left on this slide has not yet dispersed its seeds. So we can see the five parts of the ovary down at the base, one, two, three, four, there's one sort of hiding out in the back. And along the edge of the style is tissue that's going to connect to the apex of this beak and then connect down to one of these five uh, parts of the ovary. When the structure dries, it is going to cause this outer tissue to release from the rest of the beak and cause it to fling upwards in the process rolling up. The ovary breaks apart into five pieces and you can see this is a piece of the ovary, but the seed is missing. The seed would have sat in this hole right here, but in the process of springing upwards, that seed is flung off into space. And so this is another example of ballistic. Dispersal. To summarize this family, they are herbaceous. Um, they are generally alternate, except those leaves right beneath um, the flowers. Flowers are perfect or hermaphroditic, actinomorphic. There are five sepals, which can, sorry, I cut myself off there. There are five sepals, which can either be distinct or connate. There are five petals, which are always distinct. There are 10 stamen and they are going to come in two worlds of five. And so this is going to be a five plus five structure. The gynoecium is superior and there are five carpels. There's that one united style that gives us the beak. with five stigma lobes. And we've talked about the fact that this is a schizocarp that's gonna break into five pieces during dispersal. So a useful exercise in thinking about any of these families is to think about what other families have similar characteristics and then how do the families differ. For me, I would have trouble confusing geraniaceae with saxifragaceae and oxalidaceae, because all three of these families have floral parts that are basically multiples of five. So the next thing I would do is think about 
how do these families differ from one another? I would then do that game for many different plant families, all five of the ones we did today compared to each other, and then also compared to them to ones from previous weeks. Let's move on. To summarize the families we've talked about today, they were all rosid families. The Sapindaceae, which we talked about first, included the maples and the buckeyes or horse chestnuts. The Brassicaceae or Cruciferae is the mustard family and it had four petals in the shape of a cross. The Malvaceae or Mallow family has mucilage like you would see in okra. It often has an epicalyx, which are those bracts that are sort of like um, the calyx, but more basal to it, and the stamen form a tube. Anagracy was the evening primroses, and we saw that they had a hypanthium, they have very inferior ovaries, and they have four-parted stigmas. Finally, geraniaceae, or the geraniums, have floral parts that are multiples of five, and they have that style beak with the ovary that is a schizocarp that breaks into five units. <laughs>